Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to tell you about today how you could leave this presentation right now, how you could travel halfway across the world, how you could go to Mexico, Indonesia, Thailand, Nigeria, whichever place it could be in the world, and how you could start one of the leading companies in pretty much any industry in that market. I'm in fact going to tell you something even more obscure. I'm going to tell you that despite not being from that country, you're likely to be the best person to start that company in that market. I'm going to tell you about how six months ago, I, took, I jumped on a plane, I took a plane to Mexico City, I'd only been in Mexico for three weeks before on holiday, and I built one of the leading internet companies there in a particular vertical. I'm going to tell you about how we went to Indonesia, built up the largest e-commerce company in Indonesia, despite there not being a single source of reliable um, delivery infrastructure. I'm going to tell you about how we went to the Philippines and we built the largest e-commerce fashion company in the Philippines without there being any reliable payment infrastructure, one of the highest levels of credit card frauds in the world. And then I'm going to tell you who Oliver Young is and why I think he has one of the smartest internet models in the world. The pictures you see behind me are some of the companies we've been part of founding, some of the, some of the companies we've invested in. Um, we've been part of founding and investing in about uh, 30 companies so far across 40 markets in the world. Um, this has been everything from service-based businesses, financial services companies, e-commerce, payments, you name it. Um, and we've done this across a lot of markets, but I'm going to take it one step back. I'm going to talk first about my grandfather, my great-grandfather, actually. My great-grandfather, he had a Home Depot type of improvement store, home improvement store in a small city in Denmark. Um, his competitive situation was he was competing against people in that local environment. He wasn't competing kind of against people in another city. He wasn't competing against people in another part of the country. He was competing against people in his proximity, in that local environment. Um, if you take it one generation further forward, um, my, my grandfather had a candy factory, a candy store in a factory. Not quite, quite uh, Willy Wonka's, but um, somewhat in that direction. Um, and his competitive situation was already slightly different. Between my great-grandfather's time and my grandfather's time, reliable infrastructure is starting to happen. Transportation prices has gone down, and all of a sudden, you're no longer just competing in your local kind of community, but you're all of a sudden competing on a kind of more national basis. So he started competing against the whole of Denmark. If you take that one generation further forward, a company like Airbnb, Uber, Amazon, whatever it is, is today competing on a truly global scale. These companies are going faster and globalizing much more quickly than was ever the case before. Uber, as an example, is opening new markets every single week. Airbnb went across the world in, I believe it was three or four years. These are speeds that even for the internet speed or internet race are completely new. So what we need today is we need people who can help to take these companies global. Because these global environments, these global kind of competitive situations means we're no longer just competing in this kind of very local market, but really competing in this global scale, which require new sets of skills. Um, if you think about it, so one thing is globalization is happening faster, we're competing on a much more global scale. The other part of that is our competitors are changing. So what is today, if you went to AXA or Zurich or uh, Allianz, some of the biggest insurance companies in the world, Geico, whatever country you're in, and you ask them, who is going to be your biggest competitor five years from now, ten years from now, today? The question is, what would they say? They would all unanimously say this company, Google, is going to be the biggest competitor in the insurance industry in the future. Google has already hired the first insurance guys. They're the biggest accumulator of data in the world on people. Data is what you need to, you, to use to underwrite risk. And thereby, by having all this data, they can all of a sudden compete against these companies. If you take your local postal service in whatever market you're in, or you take a company like DHL and you ask them, who are going to be your biggest competitors? five years from now, and in some markets you would say three years ago, they would argue the same thing. They would say to some degree Google, but they would also say Amazon 360 Buy, which is one of the Amazon-type companies in India, Flipkart in, uh, sorry, in China, Flipkart in India, there was a Coupang in uh, South Korea. They would saw all these type of companies. So on one side, globalization is happening much faster. 
On the other side, our competitors are also changing. So there used to be a big value in having a strong home market. If you came from Germany or you came from the US and you had a huge advantage in the fact that when you entered a new market, you had a big scale. But the home markets are changing. The home markets doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have the same value anymore. Because what you see is that this internationalization of the business is happening so fast from kind of what we can call the crawling stages to kind of the computer and internet and expansion stages so much more fast than it did before. So there's no such thing for a lot of companies anymore as, as a home market. What is a home market for a company like Groupon, a company I had the privilege of, of being part of, of, of internationalizing uh, for the founders? <coughs> um, so what we need in this world is we need globalizers. We need internationalizers, people who can take a company from any particular market and bring it to new markets. In fact, almost like an army in Denmark or any other country in the world, we should right now be training these people. If we train them up, they should go through a mandatory, <laughs> kind of, you know, regulated mandatory kind of requirement from the government. Everybody has to go in and learn how to build companies internationally. Because we are not competing in a local market anymore. So we can't sit and wait for companies with massive scales to attack Denmark because it just doesn't work. We need people who think truly global. We need people who no longer say, I want to stay in Denmark, I want to live in Denmark or Sweden or US or whatever it is. But we need thousands of people in Denmark or whatever country it is who say, I want to go and travel the world. I want to be the one who internationalizes businesses. I want to build it across the world. I'm going to argue and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bet, and I'm ready to take that bet afterwards, that in 10 years from now, this word will more or less not exist. The word expat. So you saw first the word expat not being used very often. Why? Because there weren't a lot of people internationally. There were sailors, there were some people going out for companies, etc. Today it's a very commonly used word. Why? Because a lot of people are going international. It's just changed over the last 10 years rapidly already, or the last 5 years. But if you look at a city, or a country like um, a city like London, could you really walk around the streets and point out the expats in London anymore? I would almost argue the expats in London are probably the Brits. Yeah? 10% of all homes right now in London is owned by Italians. If you made London a French city, it would be the sixth largest French city in the world. Be one of the largest Italian cities as well. It doesn't take long before it also become the largest Dutch city, Danish city maybe. Swedish city, whatever it is. So the word expat is going to um, disappear because we are going to become globally, truly kind of global people in this market. So what we need are globalizers. We need people who can go to Silicon Valley, as it's demonstrated here, and take this business into new markets. And there's a, a massive need for this. So if you go to the US today and you have your choice and you say, hey, look, I want to be an SVP, I mean, you're senior vice president of one of the uh, up and coming, fast growing companies. And I use Silicon Valley because that's an environment I spend a lot of my time in, um, the internet industry. But you know, whatever industry it is, and you want to be one of the SPV, uh, SVPs in one of these market, uh, companies, you have your choice. You can pick what environment you want to compete in. You want to be the CMO, chief marketing officer. You want to be the CFO, chief financial officer. You want to be the CTO, or you want to be the internationalizer, the globalizer of the business. I would argue that in terms of responsibility, payment package, rewards, fun, everything else, everyone in this room and everybody watching this should go after becoming the internationalizer of that business. That requires a certain amount of skills. That requires that you now think about how can I build a reputation and a skill set for taking companies global? How can I learn the right set of tools that enables me to take a company, go to Silicon Valley, and take it to a new market? Let me tell you about Oliver Jung. So I had the privilege of competing against Oliver Jung in some of his businesses in some markets around the world. He's a magnificent entrepreneur, absolutely amazing, and an internet investor. Today he doesn't build companies anymore, despite being fantastic at it. He doesn't really invest in companies so much either anymore. What he does is very simple. He goes to the US, he finds the best, most well-funded and up-and-coming business like Airbnb, and he says to them, look, you guys are going to spend all your time and focus and money and energy on competing in the US. Why don't I help you to take this business international so that you know, nobody else get a chance to get ahead of you in the international markets by the time you get there? So he ran, for example, for Airbnb, the entire internationalization across the world for Airbnb. He got a couple of percent for this, which, as you can imagine, if you know Airbnb is now valued about 20 billion, it's not a bad deal. 
So the companies need this. He's doing it again now for a company called House. He's doing it for hotels tonight. I'm sure he's doing about a million businesses I haven't even heard about. Um, so very simple. What does it mean to internationalize business? Well, in his case, it just means finding the right people across markets. And it means coordinating that effort. So the world is in dire need of people who can globalize companies. Whether it's from Berlin to Africa, whether it's from the US to Europe, whether it's from Denmark to another part of the world. Um, so if you look at, if you look at the Christopher Columbus, um, he, was, he was a true pioneer. He went across the world and went into new markets. Um, Sorry, the counter doesn't work anymore. Um, <laughs> um, so he went, into, he went into new markets. And um, he did this without knowing sometimes that the world was flat. right? So what we need are people who don't know the world is flat. What we oftentimes, in fact, see is that when you go into a new market, and one of the reasons why we believe that people who haven't been in that market before are going to be better at internationalizing that business into that market than somebody who's actually from there, is because you don't know the limitations of that market. So um, when you go into a new market and you don't know the limitations, you're going to believe everything is possible. When we built Groupon in Asia, um, we were in a market where we had um, uh, competitors that were charging between plus 5 and minus 5% um, interest rate, uh, sorry, commission in that market. And we went into those Asian markets and said, we want to have 50%. Sometimes when you're in the market you're from, you know, you're from Denmark, you're from Sweden, you're from Germany, you're from the US, whatever market you're from, and you're in that environment, you're used to being kept by down, and you're used to being told what you can and cannot do, you're usually adhere to a certain norm. If you go to a market you don't know, you don't adhere to those norms. You usually say everything is possible. Just because people are charging 5% commission in, um, in, um, in Korea and the Groupon space, why should I do it? Why can't I charge 50%? Why can't I do the impossible? You see the same thing in the invention space. Very often, Great inventions are done by people who didn't know what was impossible. So what we see across the world when we invest in companies is we see that the best guy we invested in Hong Kong is Irish. The best guy we invested in the Philippines was um, uh, Dutch, or is Dutch. The best guy we invested in Mexico was from the Dominican Republic. The best team we invested in in Brazil was American, French, and German. So those were people who went into a market and said, I don't care what was possible before, I want to make my own rules of what's possible in the future. Okay, that's all fine mess. That's great. It's jolly. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here in Denmark. I'm sitting here in the US, wherever I'm sitting. And I'm watching this. I'm saying, you know, that's all nice. But what does that have to do with me? I, I, I can't go to Mexico tomorrow and build a company. Well, I think if you look at building a company in Mexico, I agree. Nobody can do that. In fact, if you look at flying for the first time, it's a pretty complex task. If you take my dad as an example, you know, flying to a new country means, means you know, kind of three weeks of preparation. <laughs> He lies out all, all his clothes on the, kind of, on, the, on the table in the middle of the room. You know, He organizes checklist, etc. I, on the other hand, can probably take a plane two, year, two, week, two hours from now, and I haven't even packed yet. So what you need to do is you need to break this down. You need to break it down into chunkable bits. The same way you want to climb Mount Everest. If you want to climb Everest, you couldn't stand there and look up and say, wow, you know, of course I'm going to get to the top. You need to, you need to break it down into smaller bits so you say, ah, these are achievable tasks. So when we went to Mexico, it was the same thing. What do you need? You need to book a plane ticket. Can I book a plane ticket? Sure. Who can't book a plane ticket? Can I book a hotel? Sure, I can book a hotel. So what else do I need? I need people. Okay. Can I approach people on LinkedIn? Can I go to a recruiting company? Yes, sure. Why can't I write people on LinkedIn? It's not that difficult. Okay. Can I, uh, can I write a contract? No, I have no idea about how to write a contract. Okay, what can I do then? I can approach a lawyer. A lawyer can write a contract. Can I ask a lawyer to write a contract? Sure, not very difficult. So actually, when you think about this globalization or internationalization of a business, and you think about going to a new market like Mexico, you just have to break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller tasks. And when you do that, when you break it down into those tasks, you're going to find that each of those tasks are very easy to do. In fact, building a company in a country like Mexico, I would argue is the same as building a company in the country where you're from, but you need a plane ticket, train ticket, whatever way you're going to get there. So break this down into the smallest chunks. Break this down into things that are achievable by any person. We call it McDonaldize it. We want to make it so simple that we can give it to any employee in McDonald's, and I don't mean that in, the, in any negative sense of the word, but McDonald's is such a good you know, kind of platform for systemizing things. A company that delivers the same burger across the world. So you need to break it down into such a granular way that anyone can take any of these notes tomorrow and do any of it. 
If you do that, you're going to find that building a company in a new market is not that difficult. But when you do build things in new markets, you're going to face challenges. The more emerging markets you go, you're going to face more and more difficult challenges. What we've experienced is that there are challenges in every market across the world. If you build a company in Nairobi, you're going to have a certain set of challenges. If you build in Denmark, you're going to have another set of challenges. But there are challenges in every market. But I can promise you one thing. The people who have those challenges in those markets are going to face exactly the same challenges you're going to have going to that market as well. In other words, the challenges you're going to have building an e-commerce company in Indonesia is not unique to you. It's the case for everyone in that market. So the question that, or the belief you have to have as an entrepreneur, as a business builder, as a business developer is, why shouldn't I solve it? If somebody else can solve it, why shouldn't I be the one? I'm smart, I have two hands, I have two legs, etc., two feet. Why can't I solve it? So when we went to, when we went to um, Indonesia and we built the largest e-commerce company there called Lazada, um, we, we had a challenge. We had a problem, a problem that kept everyone else from launching the market. It was a big problem. It kept many American investors puzzled at night, and European investors and any other investor in the world puzzled at night. How do you solve it? The problem was very simple. There was no one source of reliable delivery company in the market. So you couldn't go to a, a DHL or UPS or Danish Post or Swedish Post, whatever the country is, but you had to work with several providers. There's about, I believe it's about 18,000 islands in Indonesia, about 8,000 are named. Um, so you need to be able to cater to hundreds and hundreds of uh, islands or probably a couple, a couple of thousand. So what we figured out is we started to map out all these delivery companies. It took about a day or two. And we figured out that you needed about 16 companies to be able to deliver. So that stopped everyone. Nobody built a company because of it. We said there must be a simple solution. There must be an easy way to solve this. So we sat down, we thought about it, and we said, why don't we just, if you have the kind of, you have your flow in the warehouse, right? So you, you have your packaging, so you first you pick your products, you put it in a, in a box, you label that box, and then at the end of this labeling thing, you have one guy. It's a very simple solution. You have one guy, he looks at it and says, ah, this one is going to Bali, that's the Bali pile, that's for the company for Bali. Then there was another one for Java, and there's another one for other parts of the country. So it's a very simple solution. We made 16 agreements with 16 different companies, it took us two days more than to make it with one. And then we just had one more person on the team who was just distributing the packages between these different piles. Super simple solution. Had kept everyone else from launching an Amazon type of company in Indonesia forever. We launched the company there in 2011-12. Uh, Imagine Amazon was starting in 95 in the US. So that was how long people were puzzled by these simple kind of problems. Oh, sorry. Um, the same problem we had in the Philippines. In the Philippines, we had that problem, but we also had another problem, which is payment infrastructure. So in the Philippines, they had one of the lowest credit card penetrations in the world. Even more so, they have one of the highest credit card frauds. A lot of credit card frauds with foreign, current, uh, foreign cards as well. Um, but again, that had kept people from, from launching any type of meaningful e-commerce company there. So we said, there must be a simple solution to that. So we found two solutions. Solution one, very simple. We had a delivery company. We went to them and said, when you deliver our products, can't you also ask for payment at the same time? Couldn't you just get the money at the same time? They said, sure. We charge you half a dollar extra, 50 cents extra, 30 cents, whatever it was. So very simple solution. The second solution we came up with was we went to a bunch of different 7-Eleven types of outlets in the, in the market. And we said, look, I have a great value proposition for you. I'm going to enable people to pay in your store. And when they're in the store, I'm going to pay you some money for accepting the payment on our behalf. But at the same time, people are in there with money and they're buying other stuff at the same time. So we signed up hundreds of these stores to, um, to accept payment on our behalf. So two very, very, very simple solutions for what have kept people um, stopping, from, stopping people a long time from actually building this in the market. So what I told you is one, globalization is happening very, very fast. If you want to have with a fantastic career, if you want to build a business, I would highly encourage you to become the kind of person who just goes and builds companies across the world. The second thing is you need the right set of belief. You need to have a little bit of an entrepreneurial belief that you are as good at building this as anyone else would be in that market. And I would argue, as I did earlier, that you may even be better than the persons from that market. The third thing I told you was, whenever you start to do this, just break down the task. It sounds complex to build an international company, but it really isn't. 
Just break it down. It's very similar to building a company in one market, whether you are an employee or as an entrepreneur. And then the fourth thing I told you is there are simple solutions to all the problems in these markets, and you're going to be as good at solving as anyone else. As the last note, the last thing I want to say is um, a good quote that I heard some years ago and I've lived by ever since. And it goes that whenever you're building a company, or expanding a company, whatever you're doing, whenever you're building a company, it requires 16 days, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. So you might as well build something very big and international. Thank you very much.